Um, so I've been since March on a self-imposed sabbatical after 14 years at GE. So if you ever have the chance to do that, I highly recommend it. Um, it's a great thing to do. It's helped me clear my mind, have a new perspective, and really take uh, stock of the work that I did at GE, what worked, what didn't, the mistakes I made, the things that went well, and also what's happening in the world today. And as Andy said, right now, reputation, a company's reputation, your personal reputation is more important today than it's ever been in the world. So I started thinking about, I was sort of inspired by a book that you guys, I'm sure, know very, very well. You remember The Creative Class by Richard Florida from 2002. So I was inspired by the idea of the people like you, the go into urban centers and create this incredible economy and change cities for the better. What is the 2018, 1920 version of that, given the world that we're living in today? And it sort of came to me that we need something called the courage class, which I want to just briefly walk through. It's the first time I'm talking it through with anybody. So I definitely, I would love feedback. I would love thoughts. Um, but it's something I think that, that we really need badly right now. And I'm sure you guys will agree. So this is my son, Finn. Um, and he's, um, I think, expressing what, uh, unless you're on a self-imposed news and social media blackout, all of us feel almost every day today. Okay. Okay, so um, I think in order to understand why we need the courage class, you just, you sort of, this is, I think, following some of the speakers you had earlier, you kind of have to lean in a little bit to the reality that we're living in today, right? All over the world, but particularly acutely in the US, uh, we're living in a very divided, hyper partisan society that's exacerbated by digital disruption and income inequality, right? We're living in a world that people that are far bigger experts on politics than I am have started calling nostalgia politics. Have you guys heard that? Um, which I think is a really interesting way. It's, it says everything was better back then, which is never true for designers, right? Or for the creative community. Everything was better in the 50s. We have to make America great again, right? Meaning once it was great and now it's not great. Um, so, you know, that type of politics and thinking is inherently uh, white, uh, it's inherently exclusive, it's anti-technology, it's not good for the environment, but that's the world that we're kind of living in uh, today. And our institutions are being wildly disrupted, right? If you think about NAFTA, trade, the Paris Climate Accord, all the private and public sector norms and institutions that we're used to are being wildly disrupted, perhaps forever. And there is a real tech backlash, right? So in Europe, uh, the EU just fined Google $5 billion. In Washington, they're trying to figure out how do we regulate these tech companies in a way that is meaningful, but that doesn't break them up, which is inherently not good for the American economy. Um, so there is a real tech lash. And it's amazing, because Pew just had research that, that said that seven out of 10 Americans think that the social media companies are censoring political viewpoints that they don't agree with. Um, so if that is true, I mean, that's a majority of Americans, then there is a lack of certainty because of the disruption, and there is a lack of trust. I promise you I'm not going to be this dis depressing through the whole thing, but uh, you're like, uh, who, who invited this one here? She's, um, so I, I, think, I think in addition to this tech lash that I do think is real, the lack of faith and trust in media, I think, is the most disturbing trend that we've seen over the last couple of years. This is this firm, you guys probably heard of Edelman PR, that does every single year a global, really massive survey called the Edelman Trust Barometer. And that barometer this year, the number one, the least trusted institution in the world is media, right? Which is really phenomenal. Over 60% of people that took that survey said they can't distinguish between real journalism and what we're now calling, what we're now calling fake news, um, which is really amazing. So that just creates this lack of trust overall, lack of trust in institutions and government and companies. And this does two things. One, <laughs> that's a good, did any of you draw that picture? No, that's not. Um, it does two things. Uh, it's, it creates a pheno two phenomena that I think are really scary. Um, one is this reinforcement of the bubble, right? That you only learn and listen to people that reinforce your beliefs because you're not sure who to trust. So if you know you trust Sam and you're on Facebook with Sam, you're learning from them. The second thing that it does is it creates this insidious culture of lying. We have a tremendous amount of lying happening. We have lying coming out of the White House every single day. 
from the podium of the job that I did at GE, right? From the, from the spokesperson at the White House. And we have a 24 hour news channel uh, that lies to the American people every single day. And I'm saying this as a nonpartisan thing. You can be conservative, I'll talk about that later. But this is, this is just facts, right? Um, so it creates these, these two phenomena, which I think is, is inherently um, not helpful at all. Um, as a result, the fourth estate, journalists, are now functioning as like uber fact checkers. This is from the Washington Post. I don't know if you guys have seen this. But the rise in sort of uh, data visualizations of lying and who's lying and what's lying is something that's amazing to me. And this has like only happened within the last uh, two years. But despite everything that I just laid out, the, the younger generation is really assertive and really a force and much more progressive than all previous generations. Even if they identify as white, Christian, conservative, they're still far more progressive than the, their parents and their parents' parents. Um, and so there was this, uh, this great this researcher, conservative researcher, Robert Jones, that wrote this book. I don't know if you saw The End of White Christian America. It came out a couple years ago. And he basically said that those, that population is diminishing, but even people that identify that way are pro-gay marriage and things like that. So you really see a shift in society that I think we're not hearing about every day in the media coverage because of the way the sort of coverage of this administration in the United States um, is happening right now. And I think what's really uh, important is that millennials are the largest generation in the workforce right now. And millennials are inherently looking for a community. We're, we're also in a period where, and this was, I, I think, amazing, this came out recently, um, the suicide rates in this country have grown exponentially, 24% over the, in the last like 14 years. Have you guys heard that? So, that, I mean, it's really a phenomenal shift. So people are looking for a community, and in particular, millennials and the younger generation, and they want the workplace to be a community. Right, like they want the workplace to be a place where, regardless of sexuality, race, religion, nationality, uh, conservative, liberal, whatever, where they feel welcome and safe to go and work at that company. So companies have a real choice to make on on how they're going to behave. And the companies that do not embrace courage, uh, that do not embrace inclusive uh, behavior, will be left behind. They absolutely will be left behind. So this is a this is a, a big trend that is um, happening right now. So this is what I would suggest: is that we need to. It's a necessity. It's urgent that we together need to build this courage class. Don't you love this picture? Did anyone take this picture in this room? I love this. This is how I feel like you know once a day. <laughs> Um, so here's a working definition of the courage class. Um, and it's, it's, again, it's a working, I would love feedback and iteration and things like this. This has to be a capitalist idea. It has to be a horizontal slice of society that decides the decisions that we make jointly benefit most people. And it has to be made by people that want to make money. Because when there is profit, there is possibility. And I saw this at GE. When GE thinks they can make more money from wind turbines than gas turbines, they're going to invest in wind turbines, right? So this has to be a capitalist idea. And it cannot be a liberal doctrine. And I know it sounded like a liberal doctrine at the beginning. But it cannot be a liberal doctrine, because if it is, then we leave half of, of society behind. Um, and it is not inclusive of, of a broad array of beliefs, which is exactly the opposite of this idea of the of the courage class, and it cannot be led, I said it has to be capital, capitalist, it cannot be led by nonprofits and NGOs. It doesn't work. It has failed. It doesn't mean we don't need nonprofits and NGOs. We need all of them, right? We need for-profit, nonprofit, but it has to be led by both. Companies have to figure out how to operate differently. They have to figure out, they have to have a strong financial bottom line to be courageous, and they have to figure out how to operate differently. So, Here's, the, here's sort of a quick outline of what that means for company. What I want to do is just do an outline of what does it mean to be a more courageous company, and then what does it mean to be a more courageous you? Because without you guys sitting here, there's actually there, a company cannot be courageous. It's just not going to happen, right? Um, and what's interesting is I referred to the Edelman 
trust barometer earlier, but that same survey said over 80% of people think that CEOs of companies should have a voice in policy issues, important societal issues around jobs and the economy and LGBT issues and everything. And that was a nonpartisan um, stat. So people actually really want this. So here's a list of companies that you guys know well um, for just a quick roundabout of how some companies, what I mean by courage at a company. So if you take Apple, I mean, Tim Cook is leading on diversity and privacy issues. I mean, Tim Cook for sure, who I just saw had uh, dinner with the president last night in New Jersey, not far from here. Um, he's leading on diversity issues and he's had a very strong voice. And Apple is such a high performer, so he's able to do, to do both. Uh, I will get back to Facebook. Um, uh, GE, uh, so GE really was a pioneer in the idea of green is green which is if we make environmentally advanced technology, then we could make more money. That's the wind turbine example I gave earlier. So GE was a good example way before other big companies like Unilever and Walmart and other companies actually started environmental initiatives within their businesses. GE was actually first. CVS stopped selling cigarettes. You guys know that. Um, and that was really saying selling cigarettes is not aligned with the idea that my brand is a health company, right? And initially that was a big hit to their bottom line, but it's been a huge win for them. Do you guys know Dig In, the food company? Mm -hmm. um, it's a small restaurant company. The reason why I put this one in here is it was really interesting. They had a supplier issue recently where a supplier um, lied about like fish or something that they got. And they sent all of their customers a direct email that said, uh, our processes didn't work. We screwed up. We fired the supplier. We're going to do better. Um, and here's what that means. And it was so fast and so transparent and honest. And that's what courage in a business means, right? It's not hiding. The old days you hide behind. Salesforce has been out on front, out in front on diversity issues and on equal pay struggles that they've had at Salesforce. Uh, with women, and Walmart's really interesting because it's always been a very quiet, conservative company that's always had a ton of reputation challenges. Um, but they are really developing and growing on learning that you need to speak out, that employees want them to stand up on certain issues, and they're doing a lot more of it than they used to. And then I would leave the two that I would say are struggling right now, uh, not financially mind you. Uh, they're struggling right now from a courage perspective, Facebook and Google. Both of them, I would say, Facebook is, their, the, their actions are not aligned with what they claim the purpose of the company is. And the communications efforts that they've had have been very traditional, the opposite of the dig in, right? And I know there's such different examples, but have been very traditional. Uh, and that's going to have to, I think you'll see that change. It's going to have to change. And Google's purpose and mission to organize the world's information is not really aligned with how they make money, which is advertising. So the more those two things are out of sync, the more alignment is out of sync, um, the more difficult it is for these companies to do the right thing on a daily, daily basis. So this is just because I think this is, Tim Cook is the greatest business leader in the world right now. I think from a rep, I'm talking about from a reputation standpoint, um, I would say Satya Nadella is, is right up there with him from Microsoft. But what he's saying really here is that companies are not buildings, right? Companies have, are made of people and people have values. So the decisions that companies make have to align with that. So here's the, the courage roadmap. So like, what does it mean for a company and how do you actually do this? Um, so. The one is what I talked a little bit about with Facebook and Google is how do you align your purpose with how you make money? And if those things are out of sync, then you're going to struggle with how to make the right decisions and be a courageous company. We need to redefine HR. When we evaluate people, how we hire people, how we promote people, we need to also look at um, is this some me metric of courage? Is this going to be a person that's going to stand up for the values of the company and their values? And it needs to be integrated in. So that's a whole other you know, chapter or two on what that actually means in the HR world, which is so critical. The idea, um, the third one, integrate CSR in your foundations into your actual business. The idea, in my view, that there's a company and then there's a foundation right, you have GE and then you have the GE Foundation, is so old fashioned and old school, 
it's like we, we do the good things over here, and then over here we're going to like, I don't know what we're going to do over here. We're just going to make a lot of money and do awful things. I don't know. These things have to be integrated, right? Like they have to be how you, you do good to make money. So you ha those things have to be integrated. Um, arrogance kills. You see this with companies all the time. You have to listen to be wrong. You have to listen to your critics. You have to understand what your critics are saying. And we can apply this to ourselves, too, in our own careers. So that's a major way to, to really change course. I mean, look, if you guys have been following what Twitter's been going through this week, I mean, it's been a terrible week for, for Twitter. I think these social media companies have trouble listening and figuring out how to navigate, so that's a big one. Fight fear and prioritize your reputation. By fear, what I mean is because I've worked for CEOs, the fear is sticking your neck out and getting it chopped off, your head chopped off, right? The fear is, I don't want to get tweeted against. I just think we should lay low. I don't want to do this. When you have a whole company worth of people that want to show that they work for, want to understand that they work for a place that knows what really matters. Right? So when you're in a job like the one that I had and the one I do, you have to fight that fear all the time. Your reputation is the only currency you have. So if you lose it, you're not going to make sales either. So it's very much tied to the bottom line. Communications leaders should be in the C-suite. I think that's self-evident. Care less about the news cycle. So the news cycles, I've lived through awful news cycles. Um, the news cycle is a cycle. In today's world, it is so fast. It goes by so fast. A lot of it doesn't matter. So you just kind of kind of buckle down and wait to get through it. And it's very hard to tell executives, to tell the bosses, just wait it out, right? Just wait it out. This too shall pass. But the reality is the right thing to do is always the right thing to do. I had a meeting with a CEO recently of a startup, and she was you know, worrying about this one thing in one of her stores. And I said, what's the right thing to do? Because that's always the right thing to do, even from a business perspective. It's a simple way of thinking about it. So that's like the speed, speed uh, map, through, uh, speed through the road map for a company. But more importantly is really you, right? Because how do you, how do you think about this on a day-to-day -day basis if you believe what Tim Cook said, which is that companies are not buildings and they're made up of, of people? Um, I think the, the first thing is uh, break out of your bubble. Right, really work to understand other people and believe inherently that we are all connected at the core. That every single one of us in this room are more alike than we are different, regardless of background, where you come from, whatever. Um, and just work to do that. I just think, I don't know what you guys think, but I just think Bourdain was amazing at that, of just doing it with humility and such curiosity and trying to understand people all over the world. So he's a great inspiration. I think for that. And here's a little bit of a laundry list. But um, the second one is do the work to understand you, right? Whatever that means. You know, read the untethered soul, listen to Brene Brown, whatever it is, <laughs> whatever it is that floats your boat that's gonna really get you, meditate, Pilates, that's really gonna get you to understand your own triggers why you behave the way you do, and work on yourself every single day. That, that's the work that only ends when you're six feet under. So hopefully you're going to have a lot of work to do left with that. Get your financial house in order. I only put this on because I, I really think that, um, you know, you look at some of these people in big, high-profile jobs in the world right now, and you say, why don't they quit? Just quit. You know, like, just quit. How are you getting up every day and doing what you're doing, right? Um, and I think if you can get your financial house in order, I don't mean being like gazillionaire, like none of us are gazillionaires, but just getting to a place where it's like, if someone asks me to do something I really don't believe in, I'm going to quit and I'm going to be fine for six months or something, right? So I think that's huge. Um, be transparent, communicate often. So I led a big team of people at GE, and what I learned through that process is you cannot tell people enough. You cannot overshare. You cannot, you know, if, if there's a process going on, there's a difficult thing, explain to them, this is a hard thing. It's not going well. Here's why. If legal tells you you can't really tell people what's happening, then you tell people, legal told me I couldn't tell you what's happening. <laughs> so that, so, but then they feel like adults, right? Like they feel like you're talking to them and saying, okay, well, she's just being transparent with me. It's a huge thing. Take feedback easily and frequently. You want people to know that, especially if you're in a leadership position, you have people on your team, young people, someone mentioned earlier, you want people to know she can be criticized, he can be criticized, and it's okay. 
they're going to change course. Um, do it publicly and often in whatever version in your company, new manager assimilations, whatever it is, so people can give you a lot of feedback. Uh, and practice empathy. Practice empathy. It sort of goes back to number one of breaking out of your bubble. But I, I do think empathy is a practice. It's something that you can learn and reinforce. And there's actually a, a great new book by Michael Ventura out about empathy. Um, so that you can, you can look that up. But I think it's a practice that in order to be courageous at work, you have to do that. And show vulnerability. So one of the things I always did at GE is uh, let people into my life. I don't really understand this idea of like, there's the professional you and you're perfect. And then there's the other you and the other you is like, you know, wearing pajamas all day on Sunday and eating out of ice cream carts, cartons or something. So this is, um, these are my three kids. These are my three kids. And um, my oldest son is autistic. So that has changed the dynamic of our house and, and made it a, a really, they're beautiful, aren't they, though? Aren't they awesome? <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but I always explained to the team you know, what autism meant to the family and how that affected my life, because it helped them um, to understand me as a person, which I thought was helpful. And this is what one of my five-year-old twins did all about mom. So this tells you everything you need to know that I'm 45. And my, my favorite thing was that I'm, my best thing is I know how to work on my computer. <laughs> so that's what he thinks. I think that should be your resume right there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe I'll get my next gig. I'll just send that in, right? I know how to work on my computer. Um, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, to well yes, a lot of toys. That's what you work for is to buy toys, so not, <laughs> not to eat or anything. Um, so I do think this idea of this horizontal class is our hope for the future. I think it could be a connector um, for all of us. And companies, you know, companies can do it. I know companies can operate differently. I've seen it, I've seen it happen. It really depends on leaders and it really depends on you guys. It really depends on all of us saying, Here's how I'm going to do this every day in my life, no matter what our job is or no matter. So I want, um, so I'm going to show you a bunch of words. It was an animation, but it's not. But you guys are cool with that. Um, I'm going to show you a bunch of words that I found. They're synonyms for courage. So if you see one that you think you have, stand up and see. Let's see if who's going to join me. Who has who has one of these things? Heroism, gameness, fortitude, nerve, bravery. Yeah. All right, good. All right, good. I think we got a start of it, Andy. All right, thanks, guys. So I, I, I loved your framework, and I think we all agree that we need it. Uh, that's some significant culture change that you're trying to do. Uh, this one is from at Kim Ball Scott. What are the obstacles in culture change, and how do you get over them? Like, how do we operationalize that? Yeah, I mean, I what I I really think it's a leadership like top, the top down culture has to be so clearly articulated. I know that's kind of the opposite of the way that people think now, which is digital and like crowdsourcing and bottoms up. But if you see how um, how the White House operates, you know, it's it's really it's it's a top. It's sort of how the leader sets the tone. <laughs> For the company, so I think the tone has to be set at the top for like this is how we're going to work together, be, and then I think you need to get um, the bottoms up going, like influencers in the company, people that are at sites. You know, GE was so huge, so uh, 300,000 people in 180 countries. So you can't do that top down, right? Yeah. Like you really got to go around and get people that are influencers and find hire people that have this kind of mentality and get them sort of moving the team, okay. you know? No. And a ton of communication internally. I 100% agree with you. Clarity, communication definitely mm -hmm. works. So for the individuals here who, who may be um, director level or managing large teams, mm -hmm. how could they go about developing a culture for their unit? I mean, I think it's a little bit what I talked about with the communications and transparency. Okay. You know, the more that you talk to people, the more you tell, I think that um, what I find more often than not in business is that people think, is, is people like don't want to burden their team, people don't want to overshare, people just want to put their head down and do their job, and you have to do the exact opposite. It's actually almost sometimes a bit of an energy drain, because you have to feel like, like some rhythm, once a week we're going to have a team meeting where I'm going to lay out, like when I spent an hour with the CEO, 
even if it was just the two of us, I would go back to my team and say, I just spent an hour with John. Um, here's what he's concerned about. Here's what the analysts are saying about the company. I would lay it all out, you know? And, and it changed the whole dynamic of them as partner versus them as, as doer. That's so good. the more you talk to people, I think, the better. That's a really great piece of insight. Um, you opened a little bit. You mentioned uh, millennials in the workplace. Um, yeah. Deloitte did a really interesting HR study recently and said 68% of millennials are going to want to quit in two years for another opportunity. When's the right time to quit and how do you do it? You're asking me because I quit? No, I'm just asking because there was a, a report here that says that and you mentioned a uh, majority. See, if this was CNBC, it'd be like, why'd you quit? Right? Like, that was a nice way. Um, people don't stay in jobs. For, I mean, I was at GE for 14 years. Mm -hmm. Has anyone here been at the same job for that long? Yeah. Really? Wow, good for you all. Wow. Outstanding. That's impressive. That's very good. Yeah. It's, it's, more, it's more and more rare that you meet someone that's at a company, for that, especially if you're in the Valley. I mean, it's just more and more rare that people stay in companies for that long. And I think that's healthy, mm -hmm. you know, because I think that when you change jobs, I mean, you've gone through this, you, you get a shift in perspective, you get a new insight into things, you meet different types of people. Um, and for me, I was, 14 years, I was building something. And then GE was in the place where it was actually kind of taking itself apart. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to be, I wanted to be a builder and I just didn't have the heart to do it. Um, so you really make the decision, you know, of what is, is what you, what you want to be and how you want to behave. Is that aligned with what you're doing every day? You okay. know, and I think the way to do it is, again, I'm going to, I'm overemphasizing communication, but is to do it in a very transparent, open way. I mean, if you have the ability to go to your boss and say, I, I really want to leave in six months, um, so let's work together and figure out how to do that, I think most bosses will think you're the best thing ever because it doesn't leave them in the lurch, you know? I think that's a really fresh perspective. And I, I bring this up not for the backstory of, of your G, but like yesterday I spent a majority of time trying to get to know everyone here. And I got a lot of conversations of people who are just having really tough challenges with their jobs. And I don't want to say, oh, just quit. Mm -mm. You know, that's bad. But like, I think your idea of actually having a candid conversation is a strategy I haven't heard at all. And I think that's great. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. having that candid conversation with the boss or addressing the challenges that you're having. Um, like, I got the impression that... That takes courage. Which takes courage. <laughs> Absolutely. Like, I was getting the impression yesterday that some people are working for, like, Vol Voldemort or something. Like, their yeah, boss is just yeah. evil. <laughs> and it's just like, what you have... <laughs> Which happens, you yes, know, it does happen. but like, you know, without plotting their death in Shakespearean ways, like what are some real ways to do it? You mentioned, you know, having financial security is good, having options, any other things that people should consider uh, before they transition? Je I mean, uh, the C first CEO of GE that I work for, Jeff Immelt, used to always say, you know, you can always get another job. Mm -hmm. Like that was his kind of, and it's very, I just think you need to feel empowered in whatever way that is, whether it's that you socked away some cash or whether it's that you go on one or two uh, networking lunches a month and you tell yourself every month I'm going to go on two networks, even if you're not going to leave your job for 10 more years. Yeah. But it just I think you need to find ways to empower yourself, and then I would have the conversation. Again, people are terrible at communicating, terrible in, the, in management and leadership, right? So I always appreciated the only time I ever got mad at someone that quit on me, the only time was when he surprised me. He just walked in and was like, oh, I'm quitting. And I was so, after the relationship that we had, he like come to me two months earlier and say, you know, I'm struggling, I'm not happy with this, I don't like doing this. I, I just, it's, I think most bosses would appreciate that. And by the way, if they don't, then you're working at a shitty place anyway, <laughs> right? Like then you're working at a place you shouldn't be working. Good, outstanding. And she is a voice of someone who knows. Um, <laughs> so this next question from um, at Beth Comstock. What is your I've heard of her, yes. <laughs> toughest feedback you've ever gotten, and what'd you do about it? And what was the toughest feedback you've given to someone from your team, and how'd you do it? Um, the toughest feedback that I've ever gotten, and I've got, I, is always, in case you haven't noticed already, I'm a very direct person. You know, I sort of, I'm someone you always know where you stand if you work for me, which I actually think is awesome, because why guess? Um, but what I had to work on is, reactions in meetings and how to deliver things in a way that was going to bring people along with me and not shut them down. Um, so I, it's just something I've had to work on my whole career, which I feel really good about where I've gotten. But certainly when I got bad feedback or tough feedback is when I'd be in a meeting and lash out, mm -hmm. you know, not, you know, screaming or something, but just like 
too quick, you know, not taking the pause. Um, and then the toughest feedback um, is really, I don't really remember giving someone, I'm trying to think, you know, the way that I always give, gave feedback or give feedback is, is very consistent and often and in a very not big deal way. So I don't remember a lot of big moments where it was like this big dramatic, like I'm going to give you tough feedback because it was always small. Hey, next time you might want to think about doing X or, you know, this was, this was a great start, but you really needed to do five other things. You know what I mean? I just, it's so constant and iterative, which is the way it should be. You know, G doesn't do yearly reviews anymore. Um, I just think that's an old fashioned thing too, where you do yearly reviews, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's a good point. I'm, I'm gonna highlight that too, this idea of, especially for you, for you manager of managers or managers of teams, is just having those regular conversations, having, having no surprises, having the honest candidate of like, hey, here are some things that you should consider working on. You know, and I, yeah. I think those are great points for the audience to, to, to understand. Continues um, and considers. Yes, that's a good way to frame it. Why don't yeah. you give them a little insight into that? Yeah, so we had, so we when we stopped at GE when they stopped the yearly reviews, they started this. They created an app, and the app was continues and considers. So you could leave a meeting, and someone could say, Deirdre, you know, um, continue, you know, focusing on courage, and consider next time that, you know, perhaps it was too liberal, and not everyone's liberal in the audience. You know, so it's a. Sure. It's another way of framing, like just something you want to think about without slamming the person so they feel terrible. Okay. Uh, you mentioned delivering messages and clear communication. What's the best way for a creative leader to communicate with the C-suite? Um, so the cre it's interesting because I've seen this in two different iterations from a CEO perspective. One CEO who wanted to be a creative and thought he was going to be a creative when he grew up, and then the other CEO who's just a numbers guy. Um, so it's very, very different perspective. Um, and it, the bottom line for the most of the, I, I'm going to say guys on purpose because it's mostly guys. Um, the bottom line for these guys is the bottom line. You know, so, so they care about finance. They, money, care, okay. they care about how am I going to, you know, whatever it is, right? No matter what, they care about how am I going to sell more widgets? You know, whatever the widget is. So whatever the creative in, I, I, in the communications team, we always did this slightly better, uh, if I might say, than, no than, than in the, on the marketing side, mm -hmm. because the marketing side was far more creative than I am. So I would go into the CEO and say, this is such an awesome idea they had, and here's why it matters, because the customers are going to do X, Y, and Z, and you go, okay. So it's just, you know, that's just the reality. They, you know, most of them are just not creative, okay. you know? So, so everyone's creative, and so, you know, but you know what I mean. They're not like you, yeah. So distilling that in a way, it's like you know, understand your audience who you're talking to. What understand is important your to them? Is the right way to say it. You yeah. know, understand in most C-suite, they're going to care about how it affects their business yeah. unit, how it expects the company, how to do that. So it's important, like when you're framing that creative, when you're framing the presentation, to talk about that. Yeah. You know, and if you're in an organization where marketing and comms are together, normally they're separated like church and state. Yeah. Have those conversations. Work with them. Like they are the subject matter experts at that. Marketing knows what they're doing. Just work together to get the best outcome. Of that. Yeah, the reason I succeeded with CEOs is because I would always go in knowing that I didn't know 42 things that had happened to them. Like if I met with the CEO at 11 a.m., he'd been working since 6 a.m., and what had happened between that window, right? Like a board member called him, an investor's t pissed off, you know, this is happening, that is happening, and so they come in with all of that. The best ones compartmentalize really well, um, and you don't feel all that, but you also don't know. So you, you have to kind of be a gauge of the room and be a gauge of ultimately what I only ever worked on what the CEO cared about. And when other people would give me other things that they thought was, was important, you know, you need to do X, Y, Z, I would say, oh, that's such a fantastic idea. And then I'd go, Poof, and I wouldn't do it. Um, I'd be like, that's great. Yes, I, I will get to that. <laughs> Because <laughs> I knew the CEO don't care. I, I wasn't yeah, going to do it. And, but here's, here's the thing that's important, and, and to distill this for them. It's the idea of like knowing what's important to the company, what's important to the boss. Those are your North Stars. Those yeah. are your guiding. That's what you should be putting your energy for. I mean, if there's a project that gets on your desk that doesn't have any real value, or it's not important, or it may not see the light of day, maybe you don't spend a lot of time the on it. The flip that. of that, Andy, though, is should. you should advocate for what you believe in, right? So mm -hmm. there would be times where I would have conversations and we'd say, you know, we really want to do this, you know, really cool thing on Instagram. You know, we were kind of first on Instagram, mm -hmm. you know, with GE. And, you know, the CEO would be like, Insta what? Like, what happens, you know? <laughs> and you, so you, you have to have passion around what you're pitching, yes. right? And that passion, it goes far. Um, I, I know it's interesting. When, when you deal with news, like, it is critical. Mm -hmm. 
Now, how do you deal with bad news? And how do you deliver it? To In any general, pick an audience. Um, honesty, transparency, speed. You know, um, we when you have when you're dealing with a really bad news cycle and you're dealing with leadership of the company, the CEO, the board, it's always uh, no surprises. You go first, make the phone call. The New York Times is working on a terrible story. Uh, here's what they're going to say. Here's what I'm fighting. Here's what I'm trying to do. Way before it ever lands anywhere mm -hmm. that you guys would see it. So no surprise is always is the headline. And same thing, I think, with the team. Just speed and fast and no surprises, even if you're not sure what the outcome is going to be. OK, that's helpful. Now, um, brands are in the news for, for good and for bad lately. Mm -hmm. Now, if you were to be, uh, we'll role play a little bit. If you're going to be the chief communications officer for Twitter, how, what, what, what advice would you give the leadership there? Yeah, I mean, there? Twitter, have you guys been following Twitter this week with InfoWars and Alex Jones? I know you've been here. and. Um, okay. But, uh, you know, they've done a terrible job this week, Twitter. You know, I mean, they've just really done a terrible job. But I don't know how they could do better, if that makes sense. Like, it's so complicated okay. what the social media platforms are dealing with. Who do they, you know, I, I gave you guys that Pew stat of 7 out of 10 Americans think they social, they censor stuff anyway. So how do you decide Alex Jones shouldn't be on, but Mother Jones should? You know, um, I, so it's a really tough. So there's going to have to be either some kind of legal outline or some kind of very clear parameter mm -hmm. um, that's not being decided on a daily basis by Jack Dorsey. It seems you almost know? like it's not clear what the rules are because they have posted the rules, but then they don't follow them. They don't really follow them. And then CNN called them out on the fact that they, they he had actually had violated the rules, but they kept him on anyway. So it's okay. it's a really tough one. So I say they did a mm -hmm. terrible job, but I say that with a great amount of empathy that if I was sitting there, we'd, it'd be the same struggle. It's a right. tough one. Okay. They will, they do need to figure it out though. Okay. Uh, the NFL, uh, players standing or yeah, kneeling? Yeah, the NFL has been a disaster, an absolute disaster. How would you coach absolute Mr. Goodell? Absolute disaster. I mean, they um, talk about lack of transparency. You know, it's a group of uh, like-minded, I'll say to be diplomatic, owners um, that are that sit sat in a room and made the decision on the, the players association wasn't involved in it. Mm -hmm. I don't know why the commissioner of the NFL didn't go to the White House. I would have told him to. He should have gone to the White House last winter um, and had a conversation directly with the president and just to try to um, cool the waters, you know, mm -hmm. get things to calm down. Um, he's sitting in an ivory tower in New York City, he being the commissioner of the NFL. Um, it's just the disconnect is massive, you know, it's just massive, so, okay. yeah. And what advice would you give our current administration? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It's, um, what's it say off of Twitter? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't th take a sabbatical like yeah. I did, yeah. I don't, um, I don't know that it's, it's, can get better from a community, I'm talking about from a communication from a, yes, standpoint. Yes, yeah, we'll be clear. I don't know that it can get better because he doesn't, there's actually no staff there. Um, I mean, he did hire Bill Shine who ran Fox News uh, for Roger Ailes. Give us, why don't you give us some insight? Um, so Bill Shine was the guy who ran, ran Fox News for Roger Ailes when it was the absolute height of the worst treatment of women at Fox News. Uh, and Bill Shine was the boss. Um, and so the president just hired him to be a communications director in the White House, which is the most important communications job in the White House. The most important communications job is actually not the press secretary, although that's an incredibly important job. But the communications director is the strategic, the person that's sitting behind and you don't mm. see at the podium that's setting the strategy for communications for the White House. It's a really critical job. Uh, it was empty for many months because Hope Hicks left. And now they've got Bill Shine there. So, um, you know, I don't know. The, the Fox News is state TV. I mean, that's the <coughs> communications arm of the White House, really. Hmm. So I don't know, their, you know, advice-wise. I, I just, yeah. Noted. OK. I think the advice is stay off Twitter. <laughs> Yourself, not him, you. Like, just don't, like, try to give yourself mental breaks so that you feel good about life, yeah. OK. <laughs> I want to uh, wanna open up a little bit. Yeah. Um, any questions in the audience? Clearly, super important to you. How 
how do you see organizations that we lead here implement that across so that you see the change kind of spread like wildfire? Well, I guess I, I would ask it is a great question. Thank you. I would guess I would throw it back at you. Like, did it resonate with you guys? Did you feel like? Her question was like, how would your organizations like understand this and start to implement it? Is that? Yep, as a movement. Yeah, as a movement is what she's saying. Yeah. Spread faster. Yeah, to spread it faster. Did it resonate with you guys overall? Like you understood yes. the. Lots of nodding heads, thumbs up. Um, I mean, I you know I don't really know. I mean, literally, it's been like in my head and something that I've been obsessing on since I left GE, and I shared it with you guys for the first time today. So Andy's trying to wants me to write a book. Andy's gonna have to write it with me if I'm gonna do it. Sure, <laughs> no worries. Um, because uh, I can't do it by myself. So um, I don't know. I don't know if any ideas. <laughs> That's why I was asking. Yeah, you asked me. Yeah, you thought so. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's exactly. I mean, I think it's it. There's a lot of design possibilities there, right? Like a lot of design thinking. Yeah. So I'll think That'd more about it. That'd be something interesting to build on, and maybe we can follow up with you on social mm -hmm. to see how we can operationalize the courage class. I think Julie had a question in the back. Yeah, I just want to throw this out. Terrific response. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. Great Cavello, way to you said? Dr. Vincent Cavello. Cavello, okay, great. Thank you. That's a great share. Yep. So that's awesome. It really works. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, the word safe is an interesting word, right? Yeah. Like it's mm -hmm. the it's the permission to to be, right? Yeah. yeah. I think that it's interesting what you said, Stephanie. I was at an event, um, women spanning the globe, and uh, one of the uh, people in communications from Procter and Gamble said that really it's about making a commitment as a leadership team, and that's really the only way that you can really adopt these kind of things. It has to be a very visible. Commitment. It can't just be something that we talk about, and it has yeah. to be something that you have to check back into. Often. Yeah, what doesn't work is when companies post those, like, here are our values, and they're, like, posted, <laughs> like, in the bathroom stall, and no one does anything about it, right? Like, it has to be, uh, and the leadership teams ha the leadership teams have to look like all of us in this room. Like, you have these leadership teams that are all white and male. That's not going to do it either. You know, I mean, that, ha that has to. Okay. Any other questions? In the back. So, you talked a lot about some really positive ideas like transparency and just shutting up and doing the right thing and a lot of, and a lot of other sort of like, I guess, kind of progressive ideas. But so my curiosity is how receptive are the people that you're talking to to just like putting aside some of their other concerns and just focusing on like being transparent, like being brave enough to do that? Tell me a little more what you mean. Like, you mean if you're, if you're conservative? Is that what you mean? No, no or? not like on a political basis, but just like, you know, so one of the things that you mentioned was that doing the right thing is always the right thing to do. Yes, like yes, that. yes. And so, but it's not always necessarily the right thing to do in the short term. Yes. Like for instance, uh, it was a CDS that stopped selling cigarettes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So obviously that presents a huge hit to their short term bottom line. Yeah. But they'll probably make it up in the long run. But like, just how receptive are people to your, your coaching to being transparent? Is like, it feels just as a consumer. That there, that's often like not the default behavior from a lot of large It's not the default behavior at all. You're totally right. And it's not because people are bad or evil or that these companies are, like this idea that companies are evil, I don't believe in either. Mm -hmm. Companies are made up of people like all of us and they're good people. Yeah. Um, but I do think it is not the default. And it's that when I said fight fear, people are so petrified yeah. because reputation is so much more important now than it was 10 years ago. So there's so much fear 
that the instinct, and again, I don't want to demonize anybody, but the instinct is to cover up and to you know, say, well, we, we just want to make sure no one finds out that this happened because, and we're going to do this, and we're going to, you know, and it's, it's never the right thing to, it might help you in the short run, and yes, it costs CVS, I think, a billion dollars to make that cigarette decision, um, but, you know, they're just, you, you, it's about leaders having the courage of conviction of saying, I know in the long run, I've done the modeling on the finances, and I can convince the investor community and in the long run, it's going to be the right thing to do. So short-termism, particularly in the markets, is brutal. It is brutal, and it's killing companies. Public companies are dealing with short-termism on such an awful rate. That's why you see, not that I agree with them necessarily, but th that's why you see Elon Musk out there talking about taking Tesla private, because he, the short-termism in the market is so brutal when you're building a company, and it's brutal on decisions like that. So it's a real mix, and it's all about the the leader that you have, you know? If you have a leader that says, I know this is the right thing to do, if I take a hit, I take a hit, you know, that, that's really what I'm trying to encourage the development of, you know? Okay. One more quick one. Yeah, their purchase of, I think they just bought a healthcare Aetna merger, yeah, which yeah. may make up for that. So meaning, what, meaning you don't, but, uh, what does that mean to you? That means that they're not, their motiva motives are not. I think their values are, they've identified their values maybe and they're shifting their focus. Well, and if you're yeah. selling health insurance and you don't want people smoking carcinogens. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah it's a strategy <laughs> for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good point. That's a really good point. Yeah. Fantastic. Deirdre, thank you very thank much. Thank you. Thanks Please. for having me. <laughs>